Uh, 55 years ago, friends of mine said, when are you going to write a screenplay? And I said, when John Huston asks me, because I was madly in love with the Maltese Falcon and all of his other films. But I had a chance to meet him one night in 1949, and I turned down the chance because I couldn't prove my love. I hadn't published enough books. But in 1951, I'd published Dark Carnival, Illustrated Man, and Martian Chronicles. And I said to my agent, now I want to meet John Houston. So he arranged a dinner at Mike Romanoff's, and I took my books along, and I put them on the table. I said, Mr. Houston, if you love my books half as much as I love you and your films, someday hire me. So he took the books with him and went off to, to do a film in Africa, The African Queen, and he wrote me back and said, yes, I've read your books. Someday we'll do something together. I don't know what. So in, two more years went by. We corresponded very briefly. And he came back to town. And I was down in Long Beach looking for books on dinosaurs with my friend Ray Harryhausen. And when I came in the door, my wife said, John Houston just called. He wants to see you. So I went to his hotel. And uh, John Houston invited me in, put a drink in my hand, sat me down, and stood over me and said, well, what are you doing for the next year? And I said, not much, Mr. Houston, not much. He said, well, how would you like to come, live in Ireland, and write the screenplay of Moby Dick? Well, I was stunned. And I said, gee, Mr. Houston, I've never been able to read the damn thing. And he, w he was stunned in turn. He'd never heard anything like that. And he said, well, tell you what, Ray, go home tonight, read as much as you can, and come back tomorrow if you'll tell me about your helping me kill a white whale. So I went home that night, and I said to my wife, pray for me. And she said, why? I said, because I've got to read a book tonight and do a book report tomorrow. Well, I read just enough. I skimmed the book. I discovered the metaphors. I discovered Shakespeare and Richard III buried in the text, and those were loves of mine. So that helped convince me that maybe, just maybe, I'd be able to read the book and enjoy the book and do the screenplay. I went back the next day and took the job, and we were off and running to New York, to Paris, to London, and to Dublin. The day before John Houston offered me the job, I was making $100 a week. The day after, my income went up to $600 a week, plus the expenses. I was rich. I was also rich in having to, to find out about Melville and the, and the whale and John Houston. And writing the screenplay was fantastically difficult. But John Houston was a very wise man. He let me do the first 50 pages which took me to, until almost Thanksgiving that year of 1953. Before I turned in those first 50 pages, I went out to his home in Kilcock, and I turned the pages in, and I said, Mr. Houston, if you don't like what I've done here, I'll take my wife and kids and go home. I don't believe in, in working under false pretenses. He said, shut up, Ray, and go upstairs and take a nap while I read the screenplay. So I went upstairs in his big home there, and of course I couldn't take a nap. I, I thrashed around on the bed, nervously waiting for his reaction to my first 50 pages. At the end of an hour, I heard his voice calling. I went to the top of the stairs and looked down at John Houston below me, and he looked up at me and he said, Ray, come down and finish the screenplay. Wasn't that a wonderful thing to say? And weeping, weeping, I went down the stairs and finished writing the screenplay. Now, writing the screenplay on Moby Dick is very difficult. The book is, as you know, 800, 900 pages. I discovered when I began that Houston didn't know any more about Melville than I did. He, he wanted to do the film because secretly he wanted to play Ahab, and he should have played it. Originally, he hoped his father 
would appear in the film, but his father died three years before. So I had the task of trying to figure out just what in hell the damn book is about. And John and I had endless meetings deciding this, that, and the other. But the first thing I said to John when I arrived in Paris and we were walking down the Champs-Élysées, I said, Mr. Houston, can we do one thing to begin? He said, what? I said, can we throw the Parsi overboard? Can we throw a Fadala over? Because he's a bore and he gets in the way. And the things that happened to him should be happening to Ahab. And John said, throw him overboard. So that was the first major decision and a very wise one because it cleared the decks for Ahab to be center stage with no interference. So over a period of uh, weeks and months, sometimes I was suicidal because I just didn't know what I was doing. And John was uh, too painstaking. He liked to linger over words or paragraphs or scenes, and you can't do that. You've, you have to be a passionate writer when you begin to understand the book. And I remember spending a day with him when he was trying to change one word. I said, come on, John, that word will change itself some, sometime up ahead. Be, you have to trust your intuition. So we had one scene which wasn't working, and we spent three days deliberating over this one scene which was ruining the screenplay and the possible film. And, and we had Peter Virtle, the screenwriter, come and sit with us and to try to cure this one scene. Finally, I was so frustrated, I, I stood up in Houston's room out in Kilcock. I said, I don't know about you people. I'm going back to the hotel. I'm going to go to bed. Now, here's a pad for you, John, and here's one for you, Peter. And before you go to bed at night, put it by your side of your bed with a pen or pencil. And in the morning, one of us will wake with a solution. Just pose the problem as you go to sleep, and I'll have a pad by my bed in, in Dublin. So it's five o'clock in the morning, the phone rang in my hotel room, and it was John Houston it says, Ray, Ray, I've got it. Here's the answer. And I said, you son of a bitch, never doubt me again. The intuition is more powerful and more passionate than the intellect. And he never bothered me again about solving problems. He learned how to relax and let them happen. Well, what you, what you do, when you adapt a, a, a book, you don't change the metaphors, you try to extend them or to put them together and fuse them in a ring. There are a lot of events in the middle of the film that occur in the book at different portions of the book, up front or in the, in the back or in the middle. And I tried to integrate the metaphors into a major scene in the middle of the film. So you would have the entrance of Moby Dick. Then along the way, I knew I needed something at the end so that I had Elijah up in front when he predicts the future for Ishmael and Queequeg also add that there'll be a time, there'll be a day when you smell land and there is no land. And on that day, Moby Dick will appear and destroy all, all save one. Well, that's not in the book. But I feel I had to do something with Elijah to tie it to the, the, the end of the, of the film. So that when Ahab smells land where there is no land, uh, Ishmael remembers the prediction and tells that to Ahab. Then, of course, with the Parsi, with Fidala eliminated, you give the function of the relationship between Ahab and the whale becomes more personal. And it's Ahab that's yanked out of the boat and tied to the whale and taken down. That's not in the book. That is not in the book. So at the very end then, I added the detail that when Ahab is drowned and is on the side of the whale, his dead hand beckons with the motion of the tides. And the men see this and cry out, look, he beckons, he beckons, and they run to follow. That is not in the book. I'd like to believe if 
if, Ish, if, if Melville were alive today, he would look at that ending of Ahab fastened to the whale and beckoning to the men and say, yes, that's okay. I would have done that, huh? So it, it gives you a different ending for uh, the film than the one in the book. Along the way, in the midst of my agony writing the screenplay, <clears throat> John came in the room one day and he said, my God, I've got a telegram here from Jack Warner in Hollywood. And he read the telegram to me, refused to proceed with making the film unless a strong woman's role is written into the screenplay. Well, when I heard that, I gave a cry. I snatched the telegram out of Houston's hand, threw it on the floor, and jumped on it. And I said words I can't repeat here, calling him an idiot and all sorts of other things. In the middle of my thrashing around, I looked up, and John was writhing with laughter on the sofa. And I realized it wasn't a telegram from Jack Warner at all that Houston had sent it to himself just to get my goat. So. I began to laugh too with relief because we wouldn't have to write a woman's role into the film. And that's one of the things that spoiled the original version. The John Barrymore film, which came out in 1930, had Joan Bennett as his wife coming on board the ship and being shocked to see that his leg had been taken off. And well, thank God they got rid of Joan Bennett at the start of the film, but in the meantime, it ruined everything. Well, along the way, uh, John knew that I was a nervous Nelly and that I could be frightened very easily. And But late at night out in Kilcock, near the small village there, late at night the wind would come up and howl outside the house. And John and I would be sitting by the fire drinking whiskey, which, which I hated, but I only drank it because he did. And one night he said, Oh, What's that, Ray? Hear that outside the house? Do you hear what that is? I said, no, what is it, John? He says, it's a banshee, Ray. It's a voice of the dead mourning the other dead and warning us about our own deaths up ahead. A banshee, Ray. Tell you what, kid, take my coat and go out and bring the banshee in. I said, oh, come on, John. I went, no, no, don't be yellow, Ray. Don't be yellow. Get my coat and go out and bring the banshee in. I said, if I know you, you've planted someone outside to make those noises to frighten me. I won't go out. So this happened more than once over a period of time. And when I got home from Ireland, I wrote a short story, a Banshee, about my encounter with Houston and his scaring me. But in my story, I go out and I find there really is a Banshee out there. And I come back in and tell John how beautiful the Banshee is and I send him out to meet the Banshee and his death. So it was come up this time. When the film was released, it got essentially fine reviews, some really terrific ones. But Peck came under criticism because people said he resembled Abraham Lincoln. But then, my God, most sea captains all looked like Abraham Lincoln with beards and, and top hats and what have you. So, but as the years have gone by, his performance has gotten better and better and better. Why? Because the films that are being released today are so bad, they've made him look magnificent. I think I admired the film as a, as a totality. The casting of it is superb. Uh, the use of Leo Gen as Starbuck and all the other people in the cast uh, have, have been selected with great imagination. The film as a whole has a wonderful sweep, has a wonderful sweep. And the mood from scene to scene is so beautifully exploited. Um, I, I just look at, uh, on the entire film, as a triumph for John Houston. 
and I was glad to be along. Oh, I've got, let me add one thing here. Uh, toward the end of my writing, I was in London the last week, and I still hadn't finished the screenplay. I got out of bed one morning, I looked in the mirror, and I said, I am Herman Melville. And by God, I ran to the typewriter in the next eight hours of passionate, sweating, red-hot typing. I finished the last 35 pages of the screenplay in one day. And I ran across London, and I threw the script in John Houston's lap. I said, there, I think it's finished. Everything's in place. And John read it. He says, my God, start the cameras. What happened? I said, behold, Herman Melville stands before you. I said, but look quickly, because you'll be gone in five minutes. That's a true story. Well, when I was living in Ireland, my friends in L.A. wrote me and said, are you ever going to write anything about Ireland? And I said, no, I'm not, because I don't have time to look. I'm so busy with Melville and the Whale and John Houston, and I'm not seeing anything. Well, of course, that was ridiculous. I was walking the streets in daytime and knew all the, the beggars on the bridge and under the bridge and beyond playing their banjos and accordions. And late at night, at midnight, I loved to walk through Dublin in the fogs and the mist and the rain. And night after night for six months, uh, it was a delight to me. I loved bad weather. So I was taking in Ireland like a sponge, but I didn't know it. I got home from Ireland about a year, and a voice spoke in my head one night. And the voice said, Ray Darling. And I said, God, who is it? He said, ah, you know, it's Nick, your cab driver. Do you remember all those nights when you called from Houston's place down to Heberfin's pub? And I came in my 1928 night, driving up to Houston's place, and I drove you back to Dublin in the fogs, in the mist, in the rain, late at night, a hundred times. Do you remember that, Ray? I said, yes, I do. He said, would you mind putting it down? And I got out of bed the next day, and I wrote my first poem about Ireland, and then an essay, and then a short story, and a couple of years later, three one-act plays about Ireland. Well, I bumped into a friend that, that year. I was, I was uh, 37 years old, 1957, and this friend said, I hear you're writing plays about Ireland. I said, yes, I am. He said, are they any good? I said, I don't know. Uh, he says, why don't you know? I said, because you can't read a play. you got to get on its feet and walk it around and speak it. He says, come to my house next Thursday night. I'll have some actors there, and they'll speak your play to you. So we'll figure whether you've got anything there or not. So I went to his house the next Thursday night, and by God, he had two of the finest actors ever on the stage or films in America, Strother Martin and James Whitmore. They stood up. They walked my place around and they spoke them, and I realized at long last, after years of waiting, I was a playwright. They worked. They were, they were hilarious. And so I finally got to join a little theater group, and they moved into becoming a playwright. Well, I think the thing I should add is, I came to Ireland not knowing it. I came from a Protestant background in Upper Illinois, where we didn't think much of the Irish if we thought of them at all. So going to Ireland was no great adventure for me. I, I rather hated the idea of going there. So I settled into Ireland. I settled into Dublin. I knew the people at the hotel. I knew all the, the staff. I knew people in 20 bookstores all around the Royal Hibernian Hotel. I knew the countryside near Bray. So I, I traveled all around Ireland and was haunted by its beauty and inspired by the people. And I came away discovering that this ignorant boy from Upper Illinois had fallen in love, had fallen in love with the land, fallen in love with the people and all their problems and all their solutions. And so this went into a later book of mine 
and now very late in time, I'm afraid to go back to Ireland. Why? Because I'd cry all the time. I'd be so happy seeing the scenes of the time when I was 33 and fell in love with Dublin and the countryside. So I can't come back because I, I couldn't stand the shock. I couldn't stand the shock of beauty and I couldn't stand the shock of my renewed love for Ireland.